at uni I was thinking, right, well, how can I create this website initially um, that appealed to people like myself? You know, young 18 year olds interested in the world of cars that get all of their information now from websites, social media. Yeah. And that was it. Produced two videos from that day and they both got about 100,000 views. Each first ones yeah. and that's when we thought okay I think there's something here clearly very profitable a man who's passionate about cars behind the whole thing decides that he wants to sell you know what I had a bit of an identity crisis which sounds ridiculous you've just sold a business yeah for god's sake be happy but I think so much of my life was car throttle and suddenly I wasn't the car throttle owner I was someone else but a lot of my identity was Mr car throttle I'm so grateful Challenge me. Subscribe. Do everything you need to do, yeah? Right, what is going on, guys? Welcome back to the CEO cast. Now, today on the 60-something episode, I am with a man who I've been following for a long time, a platform which I was used to grow up on, and today I'm excited to have him here on the show. Adnan Ibrahim, how you doing? Good to be here. Thanks, Raheem, for having me. Looking forward to having a chat. No, thank uh, you very yeah, much for coming well. on. I appreciate it. So, founder of Car Throttle and now founder of Mind Labs. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure there's many things going on behind the scenes or whatnot, investing and, you know, just enjoying life, to be fair. But I think let's let's talk about Car Throttle for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's dive it well back. And for people who don't know what Car Throttle is, might not be car fanatics, what is Car Throttle? Car Throttle is um, a community brand for car enthusiasts yep. in the name like we were the fastest growing social community for car enthusiasts so yeah. back when we founded the business we were founded when youtube was just on the up and come facebook pages didn't exist instagram definitely didn't exist so we were kind of like the the pioneers i'd say of social car content and we grew very quickly from being the number one social car community so yeah we had about 15 million fans around the world and at yeah. our peak we were doing about half a billion video views a month so yeah we got quite big yeah no you guys were definitely like one of the first if not the first like biggest car platform to make it on the scene apart from like you know the youtubers like shmi or mm. supercars of london you guys were definitely up there and kind of gave everyone in my generation or my age something to watch when they get home from school <laughs> sort of thing you know whether it be a car review or it was like top gear that you should get any time you don't have to wait a Sunday. That, that was our tagline, Top yeah. Gear for the Facebook generation. So yeah, it was Friday nights, people would come home after work or after school, yeah. go on YouTube and would have a 10, 20 minute video waiting for them. Yeah, no, so you built a massive, massive website. But let's talk about how that all started. So how old are you right now? I'm 31 now. I'm so, an old man. <laughs> not old at all. Okay, so 31. What age did you start Car Throttle? And where was you? What can paint paint the picture for me of, of what when Car Throttle came to your head? I was 18. Yep. Um, I was at uni, so I was studying economics, wanted to be, be a banker like pretty much everyone else mm. my age back then. And um, prior to Car Throttle, actually, I had, had another blog called Blogtrepreneur, which um, got quite big. Got acquired by an American company just before I turned 18. So I was really lucky to have some early, mm. tiny bit of success. Yep. But I was always obsessed with this idea of building a community um, and doing it about something that I care a lot about, which is cars. So I was that stereotypical kid watching Top Gear on Sunday nights with my parents and just dreaming about driving Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And um, at uni, I was thinking, right, well, how can I create this website initially mm -hmm. um, that appealed to people like myself? You know, young 18-year-olds interested in the world of cars that get all of their information now from websites, social media. Yeah. And that was it. I was in my university kind of going to lectures or not going to lectures by day and then creating content by night. And it just grew over university. And mm. a couple of years later, we got invited to start doing video content. And that was kind of how the video... Oh, so the video content didn't start right in the beginning? No, no. It was just text-based. It was all okay. articles. And we, we I hired a couple of writers in, in America, um, around the world, actually. They were writing content with me. Yeah. But we didn't start creating video content until my last year of university. So we got invited by Volvo. So yep. not like, not Ferrari or not Lamborghini. Yeah. But still Volvo, it was like yeah. a car manufacturer that invited us to come and test drive some of their cars. Hmm. So I was like, you know what, let me let me just apply a different approach to this yeah. and create a video for YouTube. 
because no one there would have done a YouTube video. This was 2010. They would have all done articles or press reads, basically, somewhere along the yeah, lines. Yeah, or TV. Like, there were TV. T- yeah, we rocked okay. up there. And, and me and my friend, who was a mate from school, who I knew could film. Yeah. Like, he probably filmed some of our, like, football matches. Yeah. He, um, I said to him, let's go and buy, like, a cheap, shitty camera. So we went to PC World and got, like, a couple of hundred pound Panasonic camcorder, flip-out yeah. camcorder. Right? Okay, sick. We rocked up there with that. And then there were like people with TV, TV uh, grade Production, cameras. Yeah. So obviously we were thinking, what are we, what are we doing here? Yeah. There's professional people around. But we produced two videos from that day, and they both got about a hundred thousand views each. Each. Okay. F- first ones, yeah. and that's when we thought, okay, I think there's something here. I think we're creating something different, and that was our start into video content. That's not bad. So it was the guy you hired at the time, Ethan? It wasn't actually. It was okay. a guy called Ed. Okay. Ethan came and joined very shortly after. So after I graduated, we started to get cars sent by manufacturers. Yeah. So this, it sounds like a really dreamy scenario, and it really is, right? The first ones were Mitsubishi. So they said, we'll give you a car for a week. And it was called a Colt Rally Art. It's a 1.5 litre turbocharged hot hatch. Yeah. For me, and I'd only ever driven my dad's Toyota Yaris at the time, one litre, like a blow in the wind, for that was like a performance car for me. It was like a really powerful car. And it was quick to be fair, but it was only 1.5 litre turbo. And we were struggling because we needed to create more video content. And my my mate Ed, he was he had some other projects going on. So I found Ethan through his brother, a friend of a friend. And um yeah, he started just doing freelance filming for us. And today he's, you know, one of the stars of the YouTube channel. Yeah. And he's he's uh yeah, he's come a long way. So yeah known him now for 10 plus years you know the content on the channel is sick but just to throw it back a bit you started before Carthro or you started a blog called blog entrepreneur right yeah so obviously entrepreneur in the name <laughs> is that something you've always been interested in like that entrepreneurial mindset or business in general what, what yeah. was your interest I, you I think up? I've always been obsessed with that idea of how to create something out of nothing and how to build the future mm. build something that doesn't exist yeah so yeah, like the blog entrepreneur name, not very original. <laughs> blog and entrepreneur stuck together. <laughs> what do you think CEO and podcast is? <laughs> CEO cost. <laughs> That's what it says on the tin. That's yeah. all you need. And um, yeah, I was I was always, that blog was actually almost like a diary for myself. Yeah. So I would write, hey, today, here's how I learned to make money on AdSense. Or yeah. here's how I managed to get this article to the top of the search engines. And it was just about internet marketing. Okay. So it was, was it mainly based upon yourself then? It was a lot of how I was learning stuff okay, cool. and sharing it with followers that were interested in my journey. Mm. And um, even before that, my background was in buying and selling things. I had like an eBay store. So yeah, I, I was that stereotypical kid just trying to make money and trying mm. to figure out something that other people didn't know. I think today that would probably be you're in crypto. I'd, all my, yeah. my cousins now, they're like crypto, crypto, crypto. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. that's the equivalent of what eBay and blogging was back then. The way to make money, basically. Now yeah. the youngest can do it in a completely different way. Yeah. So blog entrepreneur, you had for around two years until you sold it. Mm-hmm. What was that feeling like when you were, because you were 18, you said, yeah? I was just under 18. Just because I remember, I couldn't actually, the legal docs required for me to sign that yeah. asset. It wasn't really a business. I had to get my parents to sign it. Mm. And obviously they're looking over these documents for, and they didn't really have a clue what I was doing. Yeah. So I'd come home from school when I was 16, 17, and write and check my earnings and talk to people on MSN. These are people that I'd never met before, right? Okay, yeah. And uh, then just before my 18th birthday, I showed them this legal document that basically said, Adnan Ibrahim is selling blog entrepreneur. He needed a, I needed a parent or a guardian, guardian something legal yeah. to, to sign it. And they were like, what is this? What's blog entrepreneur? What's this all about? So that was kind of the first point at which they started to also understand that I was interested in this mm. as well. Um, but yeah, that happened just before I turned 18. So then understanding the fact that, you know, you had sold um, Blog Entrepreneur for X amount, when it came to creating car throttle, was that a business move or was it just like, because you were interested in cars, you love cars, you know, it started as a hobby. This episode is proudly sponsored by Crep Chief NFT. You've probably heard or seen a lot about NFTs from your favorite celebrities or influencers buying them up and putting it all over the social media. Now me, I like to dabble a bit here and there as well with NFTs. And so should you. So if you're looking at how to start buying and selling NFTs, Crep Chief NFT is the one for you. So truth be told, I didn't know anything about NFTs before I met these guys. You've probably seen them. I've done a podcast with these guys as well. And their NFT platform showed me everything I need to know. They've got very informative guides of every single aspect of NFTs that you need, such as how to mint them and what to look out for. And in a world right now where NFTs are everywhere, how do you know which ones to buy and sell? 
Cryptiv NFT tells you that too. They give you the latest information on every single NFT project and the ones that are going to be most profitable for you. Now, unfortunately, the group is currently sold out. However, I spoke to the lads. I was like, listen, we need to plug my audience. So I've managed to get exclusive access for you loyal CEO cast followers. So it is £50 monthly and you might be thinking that's a lot. But if you look at all the knowledge that you're getting and the amount of money that you can make from it, £50 is incomparable. Trust me, I've seen it firsthand. There are people in the community that are making thousands a week. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below to look at the Crep Chief NFT website and how you can get involved. Now let's get straight back to the episode. No, it was passion, pure passion. I, as I said, I was like really obsessed with cars mm. and I would have a stack of Top Gear magazines at home mm. in my bedroom and I was a religious watcher of any YouTube content that was out there. And at the time it was only the big brands like Autocar, Evo Magazine. Yeah. You had some YouTubers like Shmi that had started as well. And that was pretty much it. It wasn't like it is, is now, today. Now. I mean, now it's just unlimited amounts of car content. So um, I always had a passion for it. And that was kind of why I was just obsessed with, right, there's something here for our generation. There's going to be this whole new generation of people that's coming and trying to find out about cars basically in the next 10 years what is the publication that they're going to be subscribed to and what the channels they're going to be subscribed to. I want to build that. Mm. So that's how it started. So you had no intention of selling it back then. As in, you didn't start it thinking with the mindset, I've sold blog entrepreneur, I can sell car throttle in X amount down the line. No, there was, it was, the, the goal for me was how do I reach a billion people worldwide? Mm. So the financial stuff, you assume that when you have like millions and millions of users, you're going to be able to make money somehow. Yeah. Um, but the goal was always how can I build the biggest and the best it wasn't you know financially motivated or financially driven obviously as it started to mature as a business yeah you have to think about does this make money does this make more money than it loses are you going to raise money for investors um, and that's when it starts to get more mature but I think before that it was just I was passionate about cars mm. I wanted to build the biggest and best car platform in the world let's give it a shot so fast forward some time when you come to like the end of your uni years, mm -hmm. how many followers or subscribers did Carthro have at the time? Carthro probably had about 100,000 users a month, maybe slightly less. Yeah. It was probably about 100,000 users a month on Google Analytics, let's say. Yeah. And on YouTube, a, hundred, a couple of hundred subscribers. Facebook page. A thousand or a couple of hundred? No, a couple of hundred. Oh, okay. So not even a thousand. We'd point. only released those couple of videos. Oh, okay. So when I graduated, we probably had those two videos from Volvo. Yeah. That was pretty much it. So yeah, but it was mostly the website. So the website had some success and it was making money. So yeah. it was making a couple of grand a month. Mm. So I thought, okay, if I go and get a job, which I think I could have, you know, gone into the world yeah. of banking, but yeah. I didn't really want to go and do that. Um, that's an option, but then I also am making a couple of grand a month from this website. Mm. It's not much, but why don't I give this a shot? Because maybe it could grow. And if it grows, I'll give myself a year, one year to figure out if this is viable or not. If it isn't, okay, I'll just go and get a job. If it is, then at least I've given myself the option of creating something. So I went down that route. I was like, you know what? Let's YOLO, give it a shot. Yeah. I was lucky that I could kind of move back in with mum and dad for a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was it. I was kind of working from my bedroom, rolling out of bed on my desk. That was it, just full time. The thing, the thing that I find interesting is the fact that I was reading up on it and you didn't tell anyone about what you were up to, you know, yeah. starting car throttle. And when I, I remember when I started this podcast, I didn't tell friends, family or no one like that. And I, I, to be honest, to this day, I still don't know why exactly. But why was it for you like that? I think looking back on it and having thought about it a lot more recently, there was a sense of imposter syndrome. Mm. Uh, will I be judged? Is this cool? Do I look like a nerd? Am I some loser that just sits blogging at home? <laughs> and uh, obviously nowadays, there's no advantage from keeping things to yourself. Like you have to be comfortable to self-promote because you need people to hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, But I was too concerned with what other people would think. said yeah. or would think. That's exactly like me nowadays. I mean, now obviously all my whole family, friends, they all know what I do and all yeah. that stuff. Back then, I probably thought that, that because in my area, no one does any of this. Like, we don't yeah. do this sort of thing. So it was just a whole new thing. Didn't know what they were going to think. Didn't know what they were going to yeah, say. Yeah, it might be embarrassing, right? Yeah, exactly, there's, yeah. There's someone might find a video and say mm. something. But in reality, the people that would say something are people that don't do anything. Yeah. So for me, I was, I learned to understand that actually the people that would chat shit mm. are the same type of people that don't have the balls to do anything else yeah. in life. And the yeah, people yeah. that do have the balls to do stuff 
will actually only respect and rate you for putting yourself out there. Yeah. And actually those are the opinions that matter because they will give you the constructive feedback that you can use to actually improve, improve. and go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, no, that was something I needed to be fair as well. So fast forward. So what year did you finish uni? 2011. 2011. So then you made the decision to pursue with car for all. Mm-hmm. Didn't go into the typical route of getting a job. So how was that for you? It was hard. Yeah. Like it was, I mean. Do you have any employees at this point? Other than the writers that you hired? It was just freelancers. So it okay. was, Ethan was a freelancer for most of that time. This guy, Ed, was a freelancer. I was still having to pay them, I mean, very little amounts because they agreed to not charge that much. Yeah. Um, but I was having to pay them. Obviously, we weren't making that much money. So I wasn't necessarily making any money mm. after all the costs had been taken out. And growth started to stagnate. So 100,000 or ish users it kind of like leveled yeah. and I wasn't hit going past 100,000 to 200,000. Mm. What do you think that was? I think it was because fundamentally we weren't focused enough on one particular thing that would drive growth. Mm. So the strategy was a little bit spray and pray. Let's try a little bit of everything, a bit of video, a bit of written content, selling some ads here, there. And also there wasn't any USP. Like if if I had to articulate what made Car Throttle different, I couldn't tell you because you could get the same information from Car Throttle elsewhere. But the video part was interesting. That was where people were starting to take notice. Yeah. Um, and that was where we were starting to gain a bit of differentiation. But yeah, it was hard. I was losing motivation. I remember actually, I gave myself a year, remember, to make it a thing. And nine months in, I was really demoralized. I just remember... I had a notepad writing meetings and stuff, but in that notepad, I almost journaled that day. And I just wrote down here, are all of the reasons why this was really difficult. Mm. And then I also made another list, which was what would happen if it fails? So it was people might laugh at me. I have to go and get a job, blah, 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 blah. And I really looked at it and I thought, well, I'm not really going to die. No one's losing. No one's health is bad. I'm not going to like, it was okay. Yeah. If I failed, it turns out that actually... It's not that bad. Nothing would have really happened. Yeah. And I think that for me helped to reset my um, my expectations for failure. Mm. Because I think right back then, I was very obsessed with this idea that what if it doesn't work out? And then instead it freed me and I started to think, well, what if it works out? And actually, who cares if it doesn't work out? Because you just got to give it a shot. Mm. And then I just went full... full uh, full focus and we raised money and that was kind of the start of the ascent so what, what let me ask you because obviously i've read part that you know car thought or had raised funds but what because what i'm trying to figure out is what how does it in, in turn help you grow the the site raising funds yeah so so let's say you wanted to shoot 100 videos this month mm. you know that in order to do that you're gonna have to pay for the cameraman the editor yeah maybe some fuel costs you know, you've got to go up to Scotland. You're going to have to rent a little, uh, get an Airbnb, Airbnb, Airbnb for the night and you're going to need someone else to drive the car. Yeah. So there are loads of little costs involved. Now, if you want to start making, doing this seriously, hmm. you might also need to hire someone because yeah, sure. now I can't manage to do the all the videos and editing and, editing and writing and yeah. managing the website, hosting, all of that stuff. Now, if you want to hire someone, mm. now let's take, you know, what a starting salary would be. Let's say you even pay them like minimum wage. Yeah. Minimum wage is going to be 20 odd grand, 20 plus odd grand. Now that has to come out of your revenue. Now, if you're only earning a couple of grand a month, that is all of your revenue. Plus you got to pay their taxes, national insurance. Yeah, you'd that probably be in a loss by the end of it. So the idea with taking on investment is to feel a period of time yep. where you're going to be loss making and hope that as you start to get through that inflection dip, mm. the growth that that cash has enabled you to have, i.e., putting live those 100 videos means that now instead of 100 subscribers, I might have 100,000 subscribers because people really like the content. And then I can start making a lot more money out of 100,000 subscribers with brand deals. Yeah. So it basically covers a period of time in which you can invest heavily in growing your business yeah. so that later on down the line, you can recoup the benefits of that growth. Now, being being like a new platform at that time when you had raised investment, the people or the, the companies that you would have got investment from, did they not think, what's this or have any doubts or anything like that yeah i'm sure because <laughs> obviously it must have been something completely new to what they've heard before it's yeah. not like they're investing in a chicken shop down the road sort of thing yeah i think the the dream was so i was again very lucky 
I didn't have any contacts in that world. Yeah. So what in the investment world? In the investment world. Okay, but yeah. I was lucky because I sent a cold email to a fund called Passion Capital, mm. who I knew had backed other tech businesses very early stage. And they their job is to take punts on the future. Okay, yeah. So I contacted them, didn't know the, the people involved, messaged one of the partners, found his email address, probably used a tool to find his email address. Yeah. And he replied in 15 minutes, say, oh, why don't you come meet me for a coffee? So I went there for a coffee and I pitched this vision, which I had in my head of this Top Gear for the Facebook generation. What does it look like when Top Gear ceases to exist and the internet takes over? Yeah, that's who pretty own- much what we're seeing today anyway. Yeah, exactly. So who owns that future? Yeah. I think I can own it. And that was where they probably went around the table and thought, this guy's an idiot. This guy's got his head in the clouds. But they might have just said, actually, it's worth a shot. It's worth yeah. a punt. And that's what happened. They 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 invested a quite a small amount for back then. It was a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And uh, they took a percentage stake in the business, and that was it. We were off to the races. And with that hundred grand, mm. we can start to hire some people. We can start to pay for content. We can start to improve our video quality, and it worked because you know then we started to touch upon a real inflection point where. Facebook was a big driver of growth for us. Yeah. Now, Facebook back then, uh, like you were saying, no, it was Lewis Morgan who was actually saying it, having something like 50,000 uh, followers on Facebook back then is probably like equivalent to a couple of million on Instagram right now. Yeah. So the traffic was, there was huge at that point. It was, also, it was also the way that the Facebook algorithm worked because if I had a post, a page with, with 100,000 fans yeah. and I created a post, probably... 80% of those people that liked the page were going to see that post in their feed. Okay. So we would post a meme. And this was, by the way, after I met my now co-founder, Gabor. Yeah. So he had a page called Car Memes. Literally, okay. does what it says on the tin. Yeah. Memes about cars. <laughs> and he had about 100,000 fans on Car Memes. And we stumbled upon his page. I think our editor, Alex, who's Alex Kirsten, who's now yeah. the face of Car Throttle. He was writing for the website back then as well as doing video um, presenting he contacted this page Mm. run by Gabor we got a link from that page to Car Throttle and instantly it like melted our servers so there must have been like a couple of thousand concurrent users that saw it on Facebook and clicked the link went to our website too much traffic and it crashed okay and we were thinking what the hell is this how where did this traffic come from so we did it again second time crashed then we're like, okay, we need to beef up our hosting. Beefed it up. Third time, huge spike in users. Yeah. And we started to realize that actually Facebook was this massively untapped area. So we acquired the page, reached a deal with Gabor where he would then join the business after he graduated. Yeah. And we were off to the races. 100,000 fans became a million. A million on car memes became a million on car throttle. Then it was two, three, four, five, six. And that was kind of yeah, how we started. Then we used that to push traffic to all the other areas like YouTube channel that mm. went from a couple of thousand to hundreds of thousands to a million. So everything went from zero to a million, Insta zero yeah. to a million. And so that was kind of the big inflection point for us. So for people who might not know how, cause I used to think of it all the time. How do websites make money? How do you, how do you, you know, YouTubers or whoever back then make money? So obviously you've raised your investment now. Now you pay them back, but for people who don't exactly know how websites work or, you know, the, the behind the scenes of it, how exactly is it that you build a revenue so you can pay your investors back, pay yourself salary and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, a number of different ways for us. So we were quite um, optimistic about brand deals. So now mm. everyone's doing brand deals. Again, back in 2011, 12, 13, they weren't happening that much. Yeah. So we were we were thinking, right, we've got all of these audiences. How might we start to talk to brands and say, right, if you partnered up with us in the content, we'll be able to expose your brand to millions of people. And so we started to do it really slowly. So we first we had brands like 3M, okay, like yeah. Car Wraps. Still big companies then, yeah. Big companies, Vinyl, Tints. Um, then we had Shell, the fuel company. And then it started to snowball. So we started to have brands like Nissan, McLaren, Mercedes-Benz, um, Red Bull became a big advertiser for us and essentially we would co-create content with them or they would put their brands within our content so let's say you have a a video about um, uh, tires it might be sponsored by Michelin 
Yeah. Or we were creating content for them. So we became an agency. Red Bull sponsors MotoGP. Yeah. We would fly around the world with Red Bull, attend every single MotoGP race and produce a, a special behind the scenes vlog of that race. Yeah, because they might need personalities and public figures to to promote their brands. So it works for them, I guess. Exactly that. So yeah. I, I guess, you know, where now it's influencer marketing, yeah. we were really at the early stages of that and we, we kind of led that on the automotive side. So what year would you say Car Throttle really took off? Because I was reading up on it in 2013... Uh, car for all or was close to or made its first million mm -hmm. in terms of revenue uh, I think the exact quote me if I'm wrong but I think your exact words were it was a million around everything in terms of numbers revenue subscribers it was all 2013 was just if there was a word for it million <laughs> how did that make you feel because that was only a few years after you had started it yeah I guess you know and this is something that it's easy to look on in hindsight, but at yeah. the time we were so focused on what's next after that. So we never really stopped to think, okay, yeah, we've got a million. In fact, I, I used to tell this to Ethan all the time. I used to say, as soon as we've hit a million subscribers on YouTube, yeah. we've won, like we've completed it. And then we hit a million subscribers on YouTube and the instant thought was, I think, what, what if we got 2 million subscribers? So there was never maybe that was a bad thing. We never kind of took enough time to celebrate all of the kind of small victories. Mm. But yeah, it was it was exciting. It was massively exciting. We were getting invited to attend this event, that event. We were making headlines on TechCrunch and BBC. Um, we were kind of very much in the, in the public eye um, because then, you know, there's a lot of fallout from Top Gear. Obviously, Jeremy Clarkson and the Top Gear trio left Top Gear. Oh, and so this was around that time? That was I think it was a bit ago. later. Yeah. A bit, yeah, maybe a couple of years after that. Hmm. But yeah, around that time, it was very much, it was really exciting. And it was validating, right? For the yeah. first time, something was working at scale. And yeah. there were a lot of people looking at what we were doing. So, you know, we our personal profiles were growing. We were all getting followers around on Instagram. People were taking notice of what we were doing and following us because they fundamentally just liked what we were doing. Yeah. So we it was it was great. You know, we were we were doing things that no one else had done before, taking some shit along the way from the kind of more traditionalists in the industry. Yeah, and probably as you can because imagine, they they couldn't keep up with what you guys were doing. Yeah, a lot of people in the auto industry thought, "Who are these young idiots mm. doing things that we would turn our noses up to?" Yeah. Know, doing things with cars like some of our early videos were rap videos about cars or what like as in we like were rapping physically rap physically <laughs> on the rapping. mic yeah it's very embarrassing and uh, <laughs> i would find the videos I them. they exist <laughs> uh, we uh we we would do things that they would never think to do because we just weren't scared we were just like you know what screw it let's go out there and try and do something different yeah and obviously for some people that they didn't like it so you know we were blacklisted by a couple of manufacturers they, oh, they refused to work with us because yeah. they thought they're lowbrow they don't understand the prestige and the quality of the brand today if i look at those brands they're on tiktok they've got tiktokers fronting their brand they they have been doing youtube for the past couple of years and they understand that buyers of their cars what were they luxury brands or yeah luxury brands but they they think they they thought that and so one of the supercar brands, I won't say who it was, he said to me very early on, no no buyer of my supercar yeah. will ever be on Instagram. Oh, is it? Okay. What, and as I, in like just having a personal... Yeah, Instagram and he was like, I'll never give you one of my cars because none of my buyers will ever see your stuff on Instagram because they don't use Instagram. I'll cut the name out, but if I had to guess, probably... <laughs> was it? <laughs> cut the name out, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spot on. He was so... Um, he had been very well you know he was trying to do a job on behalf of his hands yeah. funnily enough later on 2016 2017 we became best mates with them and so we would get we would get delivered to us yeah and they would give us budget to go to the alps to shoot a video for yeah. but i'll never forget that because they didn't really see the future so even even though like they were they were a bit all sour back then and then they eventually caught up to the fact that this is the way forward. You still chose to work with them. You didn't have any bad blood to think. It's business, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, I think you could be bitter and sour and think, you know what, I'll never work with them again. And mm. to be fair, there were some people in the industry that we refused to work with on a personal level, but very, very few. Yeah. Because what's the point of holding grudges? Like there's just, there's no point in keeping that bad energy. And frankly, for a big supercar like that brand, yeah, you know, 
we we wanted to work with them because that was my dream. My dream was to work with these prestigious supercar brands and to mm. be able to have known that we're doing them a service and it's a two-way transaction. But obviously it doesn't, it hurts when you hear it for the first time. But if anything, it, it was fuel. Yeah. We used it as fuel to fire us up and to go, you know what? I'm going to prove them wrong in three or four years. Yeah. And three or four years later, they came crawling back. And doing it. <laughs> no, that's it, just smashed it out of the park with that one. What like what moment in the car throttle history can you picture like just the top of your head where where you thought I've made it sort of thing. Well, I, th- I think the thing about me is that I think I never think that I've made it because yeah. I just don't. Humble, think, you're a humble guy. To be fair, so <laughs> I don't think that I've wouldn't. made it. And I think there's a lot more. Yeah, success is a funny one, and there's probably a lot that I could say around success as well. But I'm motivated to to do more and to help more people. Mm. You know, with car throttle, it was to make them feel happy and joy. And there were so many messages we'd get from people that said. You know, I was in a bad place. Yeah. I was in a funk. I was depressed. But your videos have really helped me feel better. I had a laugh on a Friday night. But I'd say the moment that was the, probably the most, um, th- where I really was like buzzing after it was Gumball. So 2016. Um, Is we, this when you had the emoji, emoji <laughs> to your... Yeah, I think any car fans would pro- might remember that car. So yeah. I, it was Ethan's idea. It, it, I won't forget he basically said, why don't we come up with a bunch of shit ideas for the, for this campaign? Gumball had given us free entry into, into um, Gumball yeah. in order to help them with press and, and um, PR. Ethan came up with the idea of wrapping the car in emojis. And so we were like, let's do it. So we printed this vinyl wrap of emojis, stuck it on the car, yeah. and it became known as the Emoji TR. Emoji GTR, Emoji TR. And um, we drove that around from Dublin to London to Bucharest and they shut down Regent Street for us to drive the cars down. So we drove our emoji TR down Regent Street and there were half a million people there and the videos of it where people are cheering and we're doing high fives out of the window. I'll never forget that. My family were there. It was, and at the end of it, we all got out of the car and obviously, so Max Cooper, founder of Gumball, who's a good friend of the business, he was there with his wife Eve and there were a bunch of other kind of well-known people around. Yeah. But there were fans of ours shouting out our names, wearing our merchandise, wearing our caps. And to see that brand in real life, just nothing beats that. So I was like, speak. I couldn't talk for about half an hour. I was just so shocked by what I'd just seen and the fact that there were real people out there that loved us. Yeah, that was at the the start of Gumball. I think it was that, like where the start line is or when the finish line is. That was halfway actually that year. So it was, okay. they'd driven through Regent Street and yeah. that was the halfway point of the rally. Because normal, they normally start at, I think it's Portmore or Haymarket somewhere, right? Or, mm-hmm. And then they they restart. I think they restarted they restarted the next morning around Golden Square. Okay. Um, but yeah, that year it was kind of halfway through the rally. Yeah, fair enough. So you mentioned there, you know, wearing uh, merch, caps, stuff like that. So at some point throughout Carthro, you had introduced merch. You made an e-commerce, e-commerce there. What was your decision for that? I think we were um, seeing that people were requesting things. So this was, a, again, about 2014, 2015. We had a big growing community on the website, on our social channels, mm. and they wanted more of us. And I think the first stuff we properly sold were caps and they, the snapbacks did really well. Then we moved into phone cases and actually, sorry, originally it started with stickers. That was where it started. So Gab's, um, his car memes page, they actually started selling memes that were bumper stickers. Yep super niche and you know some car enthusiasts would put hundreds of stickers on their cars so we basically started to sell bumper stickers and then we started to sell harder merch and then we started to sell car parts and accessories so we actually started to move into things like uh, candles that smelt like petrol and, <laughs> and then like actual tuning performance parts we sold okay. tires at one point through car yeah, as well so you, you had like a whole range of products yeah so. we had loads and at one point our office yeah. in central london turned into like a, a e-commerce distribution store yeah it's like stacked up to the ceiling with products we had three or four full-time members of staff that their only job was focused on yeah e-commerce had thousands of orders black friday i think we did something like 250 grand just on Black Friday, Damn. which for, or across the Black Friday weekend, which for a commerce business that really was mostly just around content, 
YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, mm. to also have 200, a quarter of a million pounds from Black Friday weekend in terms of merchandise yeah. was just nuts. Like it was incredible. So we managed to monetize our audience in, in a couple of different ways. It wasn't just, you know, branded content ads. So at this point, how, what year was this then? This, this was be... 2015, 2016. Okay, fair enough. So then how did the years go after that? So after that, there was a, to be honest, there was a, there was a struggling point. I'd say it was mid 2016. So we had raised our last round of funding. Mm. Uh, we raised 1.6 million from some pretty well-known investors to grow this platform. So we believe that, you know what, Facebook, YouTube, we don't want to be on their platforms because they control their platforms in a way that doesn't advantage us. Yeah. We want to grow our own platform. So we built carthrottle.com and we've turned that into almost like a Facebook for cars. Yeah. Had an engineering team. We had product developers, a lot. There was, there was also an app, I believe, is there right? The app. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And we spent time, money on it, got a lot of downloads. People didn't stick around because fundamentally we just didn't produce something that was different from mm. Facebook. People were still getting their news about cars on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. So we made, had to make a pretty difficult decision of basically shutting down working on the app and all of the kind of community products that we'd built. Yeah. And with that, I had to lay off half the team. So we'd gotten to about 25 to 30 people and we were burning too much cash and we would have run out of money. So I had to make the very difficult decision to basically lay off half the staff. And that was hard. That was really hard. I think it was like emotionally draining to have to... Yeah get people into an office like this and go, I'm really sorry, but you know, we're going to run out of money if we don't do something about this. We need to change direction. We did it. We changed direction, had a much smaller team and we started to move down just existing on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. We didn't worry about driving people through to our website. Mm. We kind of said, look, it is what it is. They're going to spend time on YouTube. YouTube have, have a far better product than we do. Let's just focus on finding them where they spend most of their time. And that turned out to be the great decision. Save the business. We started growing again. We helped other brands to, to, you know, take what we had learned about how to produce great social content and apply it to their own accounts. So we became an agency, like I told you about with Red Bull, with Autoglim, with McLaren. Yeah, for sure. And um, we grew back up again. So we went back from 12 to, you know, 25 to 30. And then that's kind of what took us through to acquisition in 2019. So speaking of 2019, this is where I really want to understand of, of how you felt, what was going on. And after the, you know, car throw, hugely, highly successful car brand, car community, um, clearly very profitable, building a lot of revenue and everything like that. And a man who's passionate about cars behind the whole thing decides that he wants to sell. Why? Because that, that's a complete turn of events. Yeah, it was it was the right time. You know, I'd been working on car throttle for 10 years, yeah. bearing in mind that I started at university and the business was growing and it was growing, you know, 30, 40% year on year, which for most businesses is amazing. And we were doing, you know, 3 million pound plus a year in revenue, mm. profitable. I had just learned, I think everything that I wanted to learn about that industry and it was good timing for us. Yeah. You know, we raise the money from investors at some point we were going to need to show them a return on their cash now not to say that they told us to sell but i think it was a combination of things you know it was the right time in the market there were some big things coming up on the horizon that we were worried about yeah you know what in terms platform, of like competition sort of thing no nah, platforms changing their algorithms again you know okay, facebook yeah. was ever changing their algorithm youtube yeah. changes their algorithm one algorithm change can make or break your business 100 percent. yeah uh we were working with brands to become an agency. So we were helping them create content, but they were starting to hire their own staff in to create content for them. So we were getting undercut in lots of different directions. Mm. Media businesses were going down the toilet because people want to follow people and they don't really want to follow brands That's where the as whole much. like growth of YouTubers came about, isn't it? That's where TikTok came about because yeah. people want to follow people. And that's why you find that branded accounts on TikTok are very hard to master. There are a couple that do it right. But in the most case, people want that human behind it. They don't want yeah. to see a brand anymore. And so all of those factors coupled with the fact that I was happy with where we were and it just seemed like the right time to to move on. Plus, would you say it's almost like you wanted a change as well? 
because you'd been working on it for 10 years. We also, I needed some more support for the team. You know, we weren't able to get investment anymore because mm. we weren't the rocket ship billion dollar company that investors yeah. would want from an investment. And the acquirers, Dennis, they offered us stability. They offered us cash. They offered us the ability to just exist mm. without having to worry about will we make payroll in three months, six months, 12 months? Yeah. Are we going to run out of money if something catastrophic happens? And by the way, this is pre-COVID. Um, and so, yeah, all of those factors together made it the perfect time for us to to go, you know what, now's the right time to sell. So the company that bought you guys out was Dennis, mm-hmm. right? And obviously uh, for people who don't know, I didn't know this morning either until I done my research, <laughs> but they own Auto Express, right? Yeah. Evo yeah. Uh, and a few other other big car outlet magazines and social medias and whatnot. So having that, they must have, you know, without saying the figure or anything like that, what I want to know is they probably had paid you quite a bit in terms of, you know, to, to buy the company essentially. Mm-hmm. How did that make you feel with that? Was it a big, almost like a relief or was it anticlimactic? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It was the process leading up to that acquisition day, yeah. the day where we signed the documents in the lawyer's office, and we took a picture of it because we wanted to, to to remember it. But it was very stressful. Like it, it was two months from when we met them to when we actually completed the deal. And in between that, you've got to imagine that there's a shitload of due diligence they have to do my AirPods were glued into my ears because I was on calls with our lawyers, our accountants, our tax planners, our corporate brokers, trying to make sure that the, the business was still running without the team necessarily yeah. knowing what was happening. Then their lawyers, their accountants, their tax people, their There's management. a lot of back and forth to do, isn't it? Yeah, you're on call a lot of the time and there was stress. Yeah. You know, there were points at which we were negotiating on terms mm. and there was a two week period where we were at a stalemate. We wanted something, they wanted something else. We couldn't get past it. Yeah. And at that point you start thinking, is this going to happen? You've meant, you've psychologically prepared yourself to sell the business now. Yeah. And now you're thinking, well, what if I, it doesn't work out? What just just a to- quick one to interrupt you. Mm. At, at this point, were you the only one within Car Throttle that knew that you were going to sell the business? Uh, I, th- I believe Gabs was also in the loop because he had to help me with certain parts of yeah. preparing the business and he was chief operating officer as well at, at the time. So yeah, he was he was the only one that had knowledge of mm. uh, what we were doing because I needed help. There was a lot there that we needed to kind of prepare mm. the business and get it all ready. Yeah. Um, but other than that, no one else knew because we didn't want people to go on that emotional roller coaster with us mm. because if one day things are going really well, we might sell the other day. We're not so going so good. It's not going to happen. We can tolerate that. Whereas I don't. I didn't want to burden people with that. Um, with that up and down, and I think they trusted us to do what was what was best. Mm. And you know what? I'm glad because, you know, half a year. Basically, when we ended up leaving the business, I'll rewind a bit after that. COVID hit a month after, and had it not been for Dennis, we would have been in serious trouble because. You know, we were a profitable brand, but we needed advertisers for us to exist. To run, and yeah. advertisers stopped advertising. Yeah, and I remember, well, not that I was being advertised then, but obviously I had friends who were YouTubers and stuff, but they were saying that at that point when COVID hit, no one had known what to do in terms of marketing or anything like that. So no one was given any brand deals, no one was given any sponsorships, everyone was just on a halt. Yeah. So it was up to you of how much you had saved up to take you into the future and God knows where it's going to go from there. Yeah, exactly. Like Things went down the toilet, so... Yeah, I mean, in the run up to that, it was stressful. The day we signed, I was kind of a bit numb. Hmm. It was a bit, it was a bit, you know what? I had a bit of an identity crisis because I was Mr. Car Throttle. It was my baby. And suddenly it wasn't my baby anymore. And the first day that we went to go and work in their office, which was, so we moved from Farringdon to Tottenham Court Road. They had a beautiful office in Tottenham Court Road. Yeah. Oh, so, so they had brought Car Throttle into their office? That's right, yeah. Okay, when yeah. they acquired us, we said that we would actually start to transition and move our teams into their office. Yeah, cool. And I was, you know, there was a 700-person company that we walked into and I, I was just a bit, I didn't know how to feel or what to feel. And it kind of sparked a bit of a, <laughs> who am I existential which sounds ridiculous you've just sold a business like, for God's sake be happy but I think so much of my life was car throttle and suddenly I wasn't the car throttle owner I was someone else but a lot of my identity was 
missed a cast bottle. So yeah. it's it's a very difficult one to describe, but I think the best way is that, you know, you've literally given your baby away and now you can see them with the new parents and you're thinking, why are they doing that? Just stop doing that. And you have no control anymore. <laughs> yeah, you can't do anything about it. And I'm guessing you probably had very quite a few moments where you probably thought, what now? Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think, you know, initially I wanted to make sure that our teams were in the best possible position. Yeah. And I wanted to stay. I wanted to make sure that we um, set car throttle up for future success. And actually, I'm glad we did because there have been, you know, Drive Tribe was a competitor that had launched. They just announced that they're closing, mm. they're shutting down. Whereas we managed to make sure that car throttle was in a good position to continue surviving and growing. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of times where I didn't know what to do. And it was all, all, also the time that I started to seek out therapist and coach advice as well and so I, I went and saw a therapist and I had some sessions with a the therapist I got a coach I wanted to understand what was going on in my mind because yeah I had At the kind point of, of where he was old yeah it was just after we sold as well that I kind of went back yeah. and sat down and started to unpack a lot of the reasons as to why I felt those ways and I think ultimately was yeah I came at a crossroads in my life and I was trying to figure out where do I go next what was it that you were feeling? It was, I think, a sense of loss. You know, I've lost that part of me that mm. was the car guy. Um, it was, you know, not being around the people that I'd been around for 24-7, to be honest, for like seven or eight years. Yeah. You know, great friendships with Alex, Ethan. Um, we also acquired in that process WTF1, which is a motorsports brand, and they've gone on to do amazing things, but close with them as well. Uh, Matty um, and yeah it was it was just the whole thing you know when you've gone through that kind of a life-changing experience with people when you're in your young 20s there's a lot in there that you feel attached to them and suddenly you don't work with them anymore and you don't see them anymore because you're not in the same office yeah. and you kind of miss it it's like one of those things where you know you remember the good times but yeah look I was I was um, also motivated because in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to work on something bigger, um, something that helped more people and something, frankly, a product that I wanted to use as well, which was in the mental health space. Yeah. So that brings us to where we are right now. So uh, with the announcement of Mind Labs, I, I believe you announced it on your Insta maybe a few months back, what you're, what there is, what you're involved in. Um, and it's launching, well, this is going to be hard to say actually, because... Soon. Soon. <laughs> okay, we'll say, yeah, it's launching soon. Um, and for people who don't understand what Mind Labs is, uh, what is it exactly? And I want to know mainly where it all derived, derived from because it's, it's obviously completely opposite to from, you cars, know, from yeah. cars and everything. And now we're, well, you explain. So there are a couple of reasons why we wanted to move in, move into this space. So we both had, I guess, personal experiences with mental health. Not to say that we suffered from any illness, but we both have gone through periods of feeling a bit shit. Hmm. So Gabs, who was my CEO at Car Throttle, and we decided to do this together yeah. uh, as co-founders, he went through his own battles with health anxiety. Um, he kind of stumbled upon meditation and mindfulness as a way of helping him to feel better. Hmm. And for myself, you know, going through that journey as a young 20-year-old, you know, nearly running out of money, having to let people go and making them redundant, selling the business, losing, you know, that sense of identity. I struggled with my kind of with my mind and I wanted a product that was relevant to people like me and you know something that was video first with this social community but ultimately this ability to track yourself because we track every part of ourselves now from sleep to physical fitness but for some reason we don't track the mind it's very very difficult yeah for sure so with mind labs it's a live mental health platform we have video classes that are live and on demand that helps you sleep better stress less and uh, be a happier version of you um, and they're led by these expert instructors. And when you do classes, you can basically see how you're improving over time, thanks to a number of different metrics. And that's the future for us. So we look at, you know, Apple Watch integrations. And suddenly today, you can actually learn a lot about how you're feeling by looking at biomarkers. And I can tell you, hey. What's a biomarker? So let's say your heart rate, yeah. heart rate variability. I can say, hey, your heart rate spiked at 3 p.m. today. Yeah. Maybe it's work stress. Maybe you need a class that will help you with work stress or... I actually saw on your sleep app you had a you didn't have much REM sleep last night. Okay, you're gonna have to explain what REM sleep is either. <laughs> so it's like uh, basically deep sleep. Okay, where cool. you where you start to feel. Uh, uh, oh yes, because there's like different stages of sleep and stuff. Different stages there? of sleep. Yeah. 
So I can now start to pull out that data and say, hey, tonight, why don't you take a class that's, that will help you sleep better? Yeah. Um, or, you know, maybe you spent too much time on TikTok and I can see, see from your screen time that maybe I need to help you detach a little bit more or maybe you've got some social media addictions that we need to help you with. So there's so much that you can tell now from hardware data that exists on our wrists or on our phones. Mm. No one's doing anything with that. And there's also not a way to take classes for your mind in the same way you can go to the gym. Yeah, so yeah. why hasn't that happened? Why aren't we talking about mental health enough? And it is starting to change. But, you know, from, I guess, incidents recently. Yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah. Um, in the automotive scene, um, we've seen a lot of, you know, Love Island influencers. We've seen suicides, Caroline Flack. We've seen great brave people like Dr. Alex George starting to take the limelight and talk about his mental health journey. But it needs to happen more and there needs to be more people talking about the fact that it's everyone has mental health in the same way everyone has physical health. What are we doing to help people feel better? Because the next pandemic we think won't be, you know, coronavirus or COVID part four. It will be a mental health pandemic because we're now super connected we are digital, we take video calls, we're working from home, we're isolated. You know, we're not taking care of ourselves and mm. it's starting to show. Where did where did it come from? Did it come from being in the pandemic? Is this where you thought of the whole idea of Mind Labs? Yeah, when we left Dennis after uh, Car Throttle had been acquired, we obviously spent some time off, off yeah. um, and it coincided with the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, we were lucky that we were able to take some time off and to kind of relax. Um, but yeah, in the pandemic, we were thinking this problem is getting worse and people can't leave their houses anymore. Yeah. And the future is going to be this hybrid world where it's remote and it's in person. How do we support people from home with this, you know, personal trainer like solution? Yeah. And that was kind of how the idea came about. Could you picture doing, for example, like you said, a hybrid world where it's going to be in person and virtual, maybe mind labs in the metaverse. You know what? That's uh, a, <laughs> There's this idea and this dream, right? And who knows if this will come to fruition. But you can imagine that instead of our classes happening on your mobile phone, what if you put on your Oculus and you're on top of a mountain doing a meditation or you're in a rainforest doing a bit of breath work mm. or you're talking to a coach in a safe environment and setting? You can definitely see that happening, right? And Oculus sales are starting to now finally take yeah, off. Take off, yeah. Um, so yeah, like you could see Mind Labs really being on every platform that's available to anyone just to help them feel better. It doesn't matter where they are, we go to them. And that's kind of one thing we learned from Car Throttle, right? Hmm. What platforms are people using the most? Let's go there. We need to make sure that we target them where they are. So already on Instagram, you know, we have 70,000 plus followers. So obviously as Mind Labs has, you know, you've, you've thought of the idea, you've thought of the concept, um, um, it's an app, right? That's right. So it's just an iPhone app for now. Yeah. And then hopefully at some point, we'll also get around to helping yeah. all the Android users as well. But we've just focused on iOS <laughs> for now. So having known that it's going to launch soon, obviously the people within MindLabs and yourself have probably used it. So how would you say it's changed or helped you? It's been a, basically a, a way of giving me support in a really easy to use way. Because mm. I think the big problem for a lot of people is that if they want support, normally they'll have to go to a coach or a therapist. Yep. Very expensive. Or if you do it on the NHS, super long waiting times. If you're trying to find you know, little bits and bobs on Instagram, you're not going to get classes that are high quality enough or in the right place. Plus we actually have 17 different instructors. So you have experts from a bunch of different fields that are experts in lots of different areas. Mm. So yeah, it's basically allowed me to just feel happier because if I'm feeling, you know, a bit low, got low energy, if I'm struggling to sleep, we've got some great sleep classes. Plus I can actually be accountable for it. I can actually take the product, use the product and know that I've you know, accrued certain level of minutes or started to close my rings. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just allowed me to actually form a connection with some of these instructors in a more face-to-face -face way. A lot of meditation apps now are mostly audio only. Yeah. And especially with the live classes, it just holds me more accountable. I know that if I do a live class today at 6 p.m., I need to show up because there's going to be an instructor live there and I want to make sure that I've, you know, uh, set myself up to... Um, feeling the best that I possibly can. So yeah, it's, it just holds me accountable first and foremost. And then it's got all of the tools I need to help, help me feel better. Over 10 years, over 10, 12 years, you've built up this experience with creating online platforms, creating a big audience and, you know, just 
creating one of the biggest things going. So what is it with Mind Labs that you're going to be doing different and how you're going to include the same knowledge and expertise that you've built from over the years and implement it in this? I think there's just a lot of learnings that we've had over the last 10 years of, of running an online business. Everything from how to work with the best people, how to create products that people love, how to market mm. and uh, get the word out about our products as well. And basically what that's meant is that in one year we've achieved what we achieved in three or four years at Car Throttle. You know, yeah. we've raised around four million pounds from great investors, um, a lot of startup founders and big companies like Slack and, you know, the uh, CEO of Sky. And we've also managed to build a great community already, you know, 70,000 plus followers on Instagram, which is small by our standards when we're used to the millions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I was going to say that's big to me, but that's like, probably small to you. Yeah, for a product that hasn't launched yet, yeah. it's, it's, it's a really good start. And fundamentally, I think, you know, we're a lot more conscious about what does it mean to work in a mental health company? How are mm. we prioritizing the mental health of our team? You know, we offer things like free coaching and therapy. Um, we offer, you know, subsidies on health uh, benefits. We offer great holidays. We make people feel empowered when they come to work to, you know, be able to work on things that are impactful to the user. Mm. And we care deeply about the customer because frankly, they're people like us. You know, they are 20s, early 30s. Yeah millennials that are working that are struggling because you know that sense of community and involvement is starting to be lost when it comes to digital worlds we know we talk about the metaverse yeah yeah that comes with a lot of downsides as well what happens when you don't see people face to face anymore what happens when you get that social you know that anxiety from not wanting to go out and see your mates because you spent two years in lockdown how can we help people to feel less alone Mm. and make them feel more integrated into society that's a big goal for Mind Labs, And so, you know, going back to the biggest thing that I've learned, we have to have a big goal and we have to believe that we can change the world. And for us, that means how do we make billions of people happier around the world? And that's the goal for Mind Labs. Sweet. And if people want to sign up to Mind Labs when it launches, how do they do so? Go on to wearemindlabs.com. Where we are Mind Labs across all of our social handles as well, or just mm. Google Mind Labs. Yeah. And uh, yeah, sign up, sign up for the product and we'd love to hear any feedback. Just, just a quick one. I'll probably put this question in somewhere before. Yeah. With with the way Mind Labs works, would it be similar in the sense of the whole, like a similar business model to Car Throttle almost? It'll be different this time. I think um, with Car Throttle, it was all ads based, and obviously we want to give our users a really great yeah. user experience. So it will be subscription uh, I thought um, it would been, yeah. with free free uh, trials as well. So similar to your Spotify's in that sense. Yeah, fair enough. And I've got one last question for you. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to creating a successful business. Do you feel like once you've mastered the the recipe of one successful business, you can apply that same thing and have several different se- successful businesses because you kind of got like the cheat code at that point? I'd like to think so. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We're doing it the third time with Mind Labs, but you know, we already did it a couple of times at Car Throttle. Like I told you, we acquired a business called WTF1, yeah. grew the, the video strategy of that, mm. created a new ads business, hired great people um, and there was a formula in place for it. Yeah. And I think that the formula f- fundamentally of any business is work hard, create something that people want and find a way of making money because you're creating something that people want. And you have to create something that people want first and foremost. Yeah. And it's difficult today. It's a lot of competition. Um, barrier to entry is lower. People can create things much more easily, which is great. It just means that you have to work harder to stand out from the crowd. So the one bit of advice I would always say is in order to create something people want, you have to start today. You have to be not afraid of putting yourself out there, Mm. not being afraid of taking on flat criticism, um, not being embarrassed or laughed at and thinking what's the worst that will happen. Because once you put yourself in that position, you're you're 99% of the way there. And from talking with a lot of kind of entrepreneurs, the hardest part is always starting. Once you've started, you can start to get into that cadence and then things start flowing. Sweet. Being a tech entrepreneur yourself, um, I'm I'm assuming that you're probably heavily into NFTs and crypto and all that sort of stuff. (laughs) Started to be now. I feel like I don't have enough time to, uh, to delve in and, you know, go down the rabbit hole as much as I, as I'd like, but Yeah. yeah, I'm in, I'm in. No, I've, you know what? I've got I've got great friends. Maybe you should give them a try. Uh, they this isn't sponsored by the way. So it's going to sound <laughs> like it, but it's not. Uh, Crypt Chief. They've got a whole like um, I've done a podcast with them, so maybe okay. you check them out. They've got a whole NFT platform. Nice. And 
I've basically been able to jump on NFTs like that as well. So it's, it's quite nice. cool. I'll check it out. Sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I want to thank you very much for your time, Adnan. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed this podcast. I think there's a lot of knowledge and key lessons to be taken away from your story. And I wish you the best of luck with Mind Labs and everything moving forward. Thanks very much. If you guys want to follow up Mind Labs, make sure you click the links in the description below. If you're listening to this on the audio on, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure you click in the description. You'll find Mind Labs website, all the links you'll need, Adnan social media. And until then, I'll catch you guys on the next episode of CEO Cast. How was that? Yeah, good? great. Yeah, really good. I'm so grateful. I'm so proud of you. I'm going to be a developer, so that's going to come. What you do, you do the whole team. Every single one of us. He watches up north. Challenge me. Subscribe. Do everything you need to do, yeah?